Hey guys, Tyler here. Replicators are an advanced technology in Star Trek that can produce almost anything from a starship's reserves, operating on a similar principle to transporters with their own power supplies, pattern buffers, and more. Replicators act as a matter energy converter, assembling objects molecule by molecule with incredible fidelity. Their function can also be reversed to recycle items, key for long-term space travel. Replicators are generally installed for purposes like synthesizing food and beverages, as well as creating construction materials. But they also form part of the basis of holodecks and hollow suites, among other things. And in some instances, they can even create artificial substitutes for living tissue. Indeed, their very existence has major socioeconomic implications for any civilization that uses them. In this video, I'd like to explore how replicators really work, what their major limitations are, and whether we could build something like them in real life. Let's get started. A video about replicators would be remiss in not analyzing the replicators' various predecessors, starting with the so-called protein resequencer, a technology frequently featured in the prequel series Enterprise, set in the 22nd century, the protein resequencer is an early version of what would later be called the food synthesizer. A protein resequencer is installed on the Enterprise NX-01 and supplements the ship's galley and hydroponic greenhouse. It is capable of replicating a variety of foods, including chicken sandwiches, meatloaf, potatoes, and scrambled eggs. Crew members often claim, however, that they can't tell the difference between replicated and non-replicated food. Oh, how times would change. Given the name, one can assume that the protein resequencer operates on a similar principle to the various recycling systems installed aboard the International Space Station, which divert urine to be recycled into drinkable water. Yum. The food synthesizers of 23rd century Starship classes, like the Constitution class, appear to effectively be the same thing. Recycling organic material into consumable foods and beverages as a complement to the ship's chef. In the original series, food orders are usually made by inserting a programmed tape or card into a slot but by the 2270s, these synthesizers are converted to a voice command ordering system. While in the 23rd century, the United Federation of Planets had not yet perfected replicator tech for starships, they did exist at industrial sites. But by the 24th century, replicators are ubiquitous throughout Starfleet, as they allow for a wide variety of food, beverages, and other objects to be synthesized. This is just one example of the process of miniaturization in the Star Trek universe, a phenomenon many of us are familiar with today when it comes to consumer electronics. When it comes to matter energy conversion, I talk about this process in my video about transporters, which you should check out, link in the description. Essentially, the technology disassembles objects by causing them to lose molecular cohesion, converting this molecular information into raw computer data. The object's molecules are then beamed to a new location before being reassembled. I've argued before that Starfleet transporters may take advantage of a real-world phenomenon called quantum vacuum fluctuation, the spontaneous change of the energy state of individual points throughout space-time. Some research claims that, combined with quantum entanglement, the correlation of multiple particles' physical properties, regardless of distance, macro-scale objects could be teleported without violating the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Of course, this is all still wildly theoretical. For replicators, instead of trying to reassemble objects in the exact same quantum configuration between locations, they instead store information at the molecular level and make molecular copies. Besides their storage capacity, 24th century replicators are also limited by software and the number of options programmed into them. But these aren't the only limits. For example, 
Talaxian lung tissue is too difficult slash complex to replicate, as Talaxian physiology includes a complex set of neural links between different organs. That said, we do occasionally see simpler organs being replicated in a parallel to the use of 3D printing to clone living tissue in real life. Like Talaxian lungs, Cardassian plasma distribution manifolds can't be replicated, nor can Borg cortical nodes or bioneural gel packs, a form of neural circuitry used by late 24th century Starfleet classes like the Intrepid class. Borg nanoprobes and certain metallic and crystalline compounds are also considered difficult to replicate, presumably due to their complexity. And this is to say nothing of replicators' strain on a ship's power reserves, much like transport transporters and shields due in part to the vast amounts of data involved. For instance, Voyager had to ration replicator use during its journey home through the Delta Quadrant. Replicators such as the one aboard the Galaxy class Enterprise D are also limited by restrictions on quote unquote acceptable nutritional value, which frustrates Counselor Deanna Troy when she asks the computer for a real chocolate sundae. Define real in context, please. Real. Not one of your perfectly synthesized, ingeniously enhanced imitations. This is just one in a long line of instances in which Starfleet officers and civilians alike claim that they can, in fact, tell the difference between replicated and non-replicated food. Robert Picard, for example, does not allow replicators on his property. <laughs> Get off my lawn. And both Miles O'Brien's mother and Joseph Sisko raised their children to believe that replicated food is less nutritious or is otherwise generally lacking. It's unclear whether there's really any merit to this or if it's just a collective figment of everybody's imagination. Since replicators should be able to perfectly recreate various foods down to the most minute textures and flavors. Of course, given the interaction that we just witnessed between Counselor Troy and the computer, this could be exactly the point. Replicated food is too perfect, and it's the imperfections that make non-replicated food special, or in this case, more real. Alternatively, replicated foods could be compressed like a large file on your computer, and more fidelity would be set aside for things that require more precision lest they fail, like, you know, construction materials. As far as other limitations, Starfleet replicators cannot reproduce fatal poisons, as we learn in the episode Death Wish. In addition, replicators have biofilters that automatically screen out any contaminants. Although clothing can be replicated for general wear, non-Starfleet crew members are not allowed to replicate official Starfleet uniforms. By default, replicators produce synthahol version of alcoholic beverages, though they can be manually readjusted to produce real alcohol instead. If a person in custody is confined to quarters, it is also standard procedure to disable the replicators so they cannot replicate a weapon. This has implications on our modern day society as well, with arguments over the ethics of being able to 3D print things like guns, even if it's just for self-defense. And in Star Trek, one has to wonder what other restrictions exist on civilian replicator use. Does United Earth regulate what you can and cannot replicate in the privacy of your own home? Surely they must, right? Why wouldn't they? See, I told you that the Federation is a fascist dictatorship. Ugh, let's just wait for my United Earth video before we get into all of that. And it's extremely likely, in my view, almost to the point of being absolutely certain, that civilian replicators are physically incapable of replicating things that replicators aboard Starfleet ships can. So, in addition to being hyper-advanced versions of the urine recyclers aboard the ISS, as I alluded to earlier, replicators are also a clear evolution of 3D printing, also known as 
additive manufacturing. In a nutshell, 3D printers deposit material, usually a plastic polymer, layer by layer, guided by a computer to create objects ranging from the simple to the geometrically complex. That said, fictional replicators' ubiquity throughout Starfleet, particularly in The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, was rather unpopular with the writers of those shows. Can you guess why? Iris Stephen Bear once commented, I'd like to lose the replicators. They're my least favorite thing in Star Trek. A society that uses replicators is a doomed, finished society. Ronald D. Moore added, Replicators are the worst thing ever. Destroys storytelling all the time. They mean there's no value to anything. Nothing has value in the universe if you can just replicate everything, so all that goes away. Nothing is unique. If you break something, you can just make another one. If something breaks on the ship, it's, oh, no big deal. Geordi can just go down to engineering and make another doozy what's it. Or they go to a planet and that planet needed something. Oh, hey, let's just make them what they need. We just hated it and tried to forget about it as much as possible. Damn. So the question that I pose to all of you is, do you agree with these sentiments? Are replicators really the universe-breaking technology that a lot of the writers deem them to be? One thing that's clear is that replicators are a key component of 24th century Star Trek's quasi-post-scarcity society and economy. Many futurist writers have levied that if people have their material needs met and there's inherently reduced risk of resource shortages, then people would have more free time to explore creative passions and pursue professions, say, like science or space exploration. This is, of course, predicated on the ability of most hard labor to be automated, and the value of that labor being fairly distributed among the population. And naturally, even in what we would call a post-scarcity society, some commodities and materials would still be scarce. As we see in Star Trek, dilithium, essential for regulating the matter-antimatter reaction in warp cores, is explicitly a non-renewable energy source, in large part because it can't be replicated. It can, however, be argued that a society without poverty is still possible even without this magical technology. Only with a more equitable distribution of resources and a competent and willing government <laughs> uh, yeah, competent government. Admittedly, a very tall order in today's climate. <laughs> uh, uh, competent government. That's a good one. I'm I'm not a libertarian, but it's okay. We we can all laugh at the joke. It's fine. Okay, it it still doesn't feel like this video's finished. So a little more food for thought before I go. Much like with replicators, many have written about the potential and even the current effects of 3D printers on the global supply chain. With manufacturing being more localized production would occur in response to immediate demand rather than forecasted demand. Oh, and would you look at that? Whoops! There goes the entire basis of modern capitalism. In this paradigm, with the reduced need for both transportation and warehousing, both the cost and environmental impact of manufacturing would be greatly reduced. Furthermore, international trade would be more oriented around the exchange of ideas and digital capital rather than traditional goods and services. The line between home and workplace would be further eroded, and we'd have to rethink how we'd reward automated labor as vast swaths of people become unemployed. And none of this is to mention the effect that 3D printing will continue to have on intellectual property rights. Understandably, many view this as a recipe for a dystopian hellscape, which, granted, could happen, can happen, if we take the wrong steps. But even if we never create a technology as advanced as the Star Trek replicator, optimists like many Star Trek fans view this as a grand opportunity to bring about various aspects of the Trek future. A hopeful future that, while still dependent on our ability to overcome other ills like disease, racism, and war, is achievable if we put our minds to it.
that's at least what a lot of Trekkies believe. Do you? Let me know down below. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a member or a patron is a great way to do so. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.